Hello everyone, welcome to another Directions Mag Geospatial webinar today sponsored by our friends at NearMap. I'm Barbara Duke, Managing Editor here at Directions Magazine, joined by our webinar producer, Lynette Qualia. We hope that you will read the latest news articles, listen to podcasts, or of course watch more webinars at directionsmag.com. We are excited to have Charles Staten back to talk with us about integrating multidimensional high resolution imagery and location intelligence into your emergency response workflows. He's got some good videos and demonstrations for us. Welcome back, Charles. We're glad to have you with us again. Thank you so much, Barbary. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm thrilled to be back to do another webinar with Directions Magazine today. Um, as Barbary mentioned, my name is Charles Staten. I am the manager of the U.S. Solutions Engineering Group, so our technical experts here at NearMap. And today I'm going to be talking to you about NearMap's call to action for emergency response and resilience. So um, a little bit about NearMap. Uh, we are actually headquartered in Sydney, Australia. We're a publicly traded company listed on the Australian Stock Exchange and, ex and established in 2007. Uh, we started flying the United States in 2014 so you're going to have access to that entire historical archive of imagery dating back to 2014. We have over 10,000 customers globally. We capture in our markets uh, in Australia, the United States, New Zealand, and Canada currently. We have a patented end-to-end -end processing pipeline as well as camera systems. So we are producing all near map content and the uh, mechanisms that collect and deliver that content in-house. We have been a Esri Gold partner since 2019, and due to that partnership, we are working ever more closely with Esri. We do have that patented camera system, uh, which actually uh, we have two currently, one we call Hyper Camera One, that produces a 2.8 inch vertical GSD ortho aerial image. And then we have our latest camera system, which is called Hyper Camera Two. Uh, it actually sits on the bottom of the aircraft and is able to rotate as it flies. And we're capturing oblique and panorama images from anywhere from zero to 45 degrees. We are designed and optimized for the cloud with our pro patented processing pipeline. We're able to host all of that data and imagery uh, within just a couple weeks of capture. And you can see that by logging into our lightweight web application called Map Browser using a suite of our scalable APIs to integrate imagery and other types of content into GIS and CAD software. And last, but we are more than aerial imagery. Uh, we have uh, really progressed in uh, terms of imaging technology and created derivative products uh, from our latest camera system, as well as the use of feature extraction with automated feature um, location intelligence. Uh, using machine learning and artificial intelligence. So we are operating on a proactive capture model. Um, all of the imagery that NearMap collects is going to be less than a year old. We fly these large uh, metro urban regions that are experiencing a lot of change and growth up to three times a year. So our end users can see that leaf on and leaf off uh, breadth of imagery. Uh, this this Patented photo, uh, this patented processing pipeline is all automated. So that is how we are able to scale and capture such large regions across all four of our markets. Um, it is insanely adoptable uh, for use inside of our lightweight web application, which is Met Browser, or due to that Esri partnership that we fostered in 2019 to be able to use our Esri Marketplace item, which is uh, an item on the Esri marketplace that will stream a tiled service of near map imagery into any Esri ecosystem that you're working with. Uh, we offer a plug and play business model as well. So first, our highlight of our lightweight web application, that's going to be Map Browser, where all you need is an active near map subscription and a username and password to log in. Next is our Esri marketplace item. Uh, I briefly touched on this before, but due to our partnership with Esri, we want to make that integration of content insanely adoptable. And what we've done is, just like uh, an app on the App Store, 
we have created a NearMap US vertical imagery app on the Esri marketplace. You can simply add this to ArcGIS Online, Arc Pro, Arc Map, any Esri environment uh, that will uh, reach to ArcGIS Online, and you'll be able to ingest that into your ecosystem. The other uh, application and integration methods that we really use a lot is going to be our WMS or Web Map service. We've created several iterations of this WMS, and our latest one is going to be our custom WMS or WMS 2.0 where we've made some improvements over our first iteration. You'll be able to draw a polygon up to 1,930 square miles large. You can bring that uh, polygon of data into uh, your ArcGIS or CAD environment via a WMS. You'll be able to transform that service into any coordinate system of your choosing to line up with your existing data. And you'll also be able to travel historically through that catalog of historical vintages as well. So these are the three main plug and play integration methods that we use here at NearMap and our customers uh, continue to improve. Our coverage program is ever expanding. Uh, right now in the United States, we just cover just over 80% of the US population with nearly half a million square miles covered annually. All of these urban areas are going to be captured in our tier systems and of course you're going to be able to access that imagery dating back to 2014. So let's look at another map um, where, we, where we've really progressed and moved from 126 counties uh, to over 80 percent coverage to now almost 320 U.S. counties with over 80 percent coverage. Now this map that you're looking at right now I'll kind of break down that orange or red color that's going to have the, uh, the largest uh, business case for us. So you can think of those as those large cities like Dallas, Seattle, Los Angeles, New York, Philadelphia, all those large regions that are undergoing a lot of change and growth. We capture those with our latest camera systems up to three times per year so that people can see the leaf on and leaf off of the imagery, but also be privy to our derivative products that are captured with our oblique camera system like our 3D content. The blue regions, those are more of our sub-urban uh, environments. And those might only get captured one or two times a year. And those are gonna be captured with an ortho camera, so vertical imagery only. Uh, but the great thing about our artificial intelligence offering is it is going to be run on our entire catalog of imagery moving forward. So you're always gonna get those AI insights no matter if we capture with just our regular vertical camera or our uh, higher end oblique camera as well. So let's take a look at the products that we produce. From left to right, you can see we have a vertical image. That's going to be anywhere from 2.2 to 2.8 inch GSD. We have a panorama offering inside of our web application map browser, as well as a API that you're able to stream that panorama imagery from. Now this panorama uh, is a fixed 45 degree angle. So you can kind of think of it as, um, you know, a uninterrupted pan and zoom uh, feature that will allow you to really hone in on your area of interest in your site, giving you good perspective about your operating picture. Now the oblique differs from the panorama in that it returns the actual source tile from the photograph and allows you to measure aspects of that image like height and width. Those images are going to be at an even higher resolution and that's 2.2 inch GSD or 5.5 centimeters. Next is our uh, first derivative product that we create and that is our NearMap 3D. This is a reality textured mesh uh, that is created first from the oblique camera. So you can think of the way as we fly, sort of like mowing the lawn, going back and forth with that camera system rotating on the bottom of the aircraft, capturing images from different look angles and different cardinal directions. So we create this reality mesh product first. And last but not least, we have our flagship product, which is NearMap AI. And that's where we get into machine learning, and automated feature extraction from high-resolution aerial imagery. So let's move on to NearMap 
3D. Uh, I just talked about that it is created from our latest camera system, uh, the one that produces the obliques. Um, and we produce the textured mesh first because it's the easiest, really. Um, and what it is, is a high resolution um, oblique image draped over a wire frame lattice. Now, this comes in at a 15 centimeter or six inch resolution. And uh, what that means is the accuracy of measurements made on this type of content are going to be just under a foot. Uh, what this allows you to do is really reduce time to survey existing conditions and allow you to measure with a vertical datum presence. We do produce this in a vertical datum, which is EGM 2008, or the Earth Gravitational Model as it was flown in 2008 for our vertical re reference system. Uh, but we can produce this in other uh, types of vertical datums, mainly NAV D88 if you're working with existing NAD83 data. With this textured mesh, you can easily communicate conditions and locations on the ground. You're able to measure height, area, length, and real-world elevation values. So this is a cost-effective optioneering uh, path that you can take in a real-world context to provide context to your building site, uh, perform viewshed or line-of-sight analyses, or some other um, aspects of emergency response and resilience that we're going to get into a little bit later. This is uh, Pompano Beach, Florida. Just wanted to give a fly through and showcase everyone uh, the high resolution 15 centimeter near map reality mesh. This can be exported in a scene layer package or SLPK format for Esri um, operating systems. We can produce this in OBJ and FBX for Autodesk applications like InfraWorks or Revit. Uh, we can also produce this in 3MX format, which is the Bentley native format. So you're going to be using 3MX if you're using anything like Bentley's Open Roads Designer or Context Capture, things like that. So we produce this in a variety of file types so that you're able to leverage all of this content no matter what uh, third-party application you're using. So uh, we just reviewed the textured mesh. Everything that we produce is from photogrammetry and our in-house camera systems. Next, we produce a point cloud that is photometrically, photogrammetrically generated. We do not have a LiDAR sensor on our camera. This is from RGB values. So this is a very dense data set for the point cloud coming in at around 44 points per square meter, where LiDAR data sets are around 10 to 15 points per square meter. Now, um, some of you that are familiar working with LiDAR are probably wonder wondering if this is classified. Since we don't have an actual sensor um, on the camera, it is not classified uh, by bare earth, ground, building, et cetera, like a LiDAR is. Um, but what you can do is use this to sort of augment um, and add value to your gap years if you are receiving LiDAR data. So you can actually increase the accuracy of your existing point clouds by augmenting uh, near maps photogrammetric point clouds into your LAS data set. Next, we have what I like to call sort of the two and a half D products. And that's going to be our digital surface model and digital elevation or digital terrain model. So this DSM is a raster, and it is based on the elevation of pixel values so that we can see those taller buildings in the uh, lighter yellow color and then uh, lower elevations in the dark purple. So that's going to give you a, a better automated experience if you're running a lot of geoprocessing tools. Um, all of these three pieces of 3D content are going to be the same resolution because they're coming from the same sensor. And again, that is a 15 centimeter or six inch resolution, where all of our imagery is going to be sub three inch resolution. Then we have our digital elevation or terrain model. We actually use our artificial intelligence offering as well as our existing 3D content to interpolate those ground points and give you that bare earth scenario, where now you're able to create even more derivative products from NearMap, like contours. 
we also have a true ortho offering. This is a top-down nadir view, uh, zero degrees, and it is a high-resolution aerial image with eliminated building lean. So if you're working in areas like New York City with a lot of tall buildings and experiencing a little bit of that parallax, the true ortho product is going to remedy that for you. Now, um, right now we are offering the textured mesh and point cloud in a um, offline uh, delivery method. So uh, the way that works is if you want these products, you send us a, a shape file or a KML of the area of your interest, and then we will deliver that to you uh, via an Amazon S3 download or a hard drive um, if you need to have it on premises. Now, with our digital surface model, digital terrain, and true ortho, we actually have a DSM API where you can call a location, a Latin long, and it will return a 200 meter by 200 meter area uh, of a digital surface model. So you can get a detailed DSM, a true ortho, and a high resolution vertical image, all from an API call. All right, my favorite. Now we get to near map AI. Well, what is it? So, NearMap's been working on AI for about the past three and a half, four years. And what we've created is a truly scalable solution. We're extracting these data insights from high resolution imagery, running all of our historical catalog through this training algorithm for it, for it to identify and extract these features on the ground. Some of them include swimming pools, solar panels, vegetation, building footprints, uh, surfaces like asphalt, concrete, lawn grass, um, all of these items that we're collecting. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a growing list as well. So mostly driven by our customers, what they want to see out of the high resolution imagery. So these are all available to view inside of Map Browser as rasterized layers. Now you can kind of see on this screenshot where some of the houses might not be filled in or quote unquote, as bright as other houses. That's because um, the color that you will see on Map Browser is really denoting near Map's confidence level. So those really bright uh, and fine edges there uh, in the screen are going to have a, a very high confidence level. So see how they're very sharp around this roof for the building footprint? That's going to indicate a 99 or above 99% confidence level. Uh, over here, uh, we have a concrete or, or another roof aspect here, and it's not coming through um, as clear or as bright as that other house. And that's because uh, NearMap is not as confident as it was in labeling uh, that other house. So uh, we started this with rasterization. And then um, now to our second point, our export and APIs. So once these vectorization processes have been considered, now we're getting to that concrete data that our users really want us to provide. So it's going to be a closed polygon uh, around the actual feature and include attributes and metadata about when, uh, when that feature was captured, the estimated area square footage, our confidence level, the date of the capture, and some other aspects as well. And we usually deliver these in an offline format as well. So same as the three-dimensional, or we also have an AI feature API that you can call and return a set of AI packs that you're currently subscribed to. So let's take a look at some of those. Uh, we are collecting construction sites. So anything that's going to be categorized as a construction site is going to have excavation works in it, maybe a foundation exposed or slab or frames or something like that. And we're capturing both residential and commercial. We're also capturing things like solar panels and giving you the estimated area square footage of those. Swimming pools, in-ground and above-ground pools. Also impervious surfaces. That's going to include things like building footprints, building characteristics, asphalt, concrete, um, and other layers as well. We also have building characteristics and roof characteristics. 
So what type of roof material is evident there? Is it tile, metal, shingle? What shape of the roof is it? Is it a hip roof, a gable roof, or a Dutch gable roof? Also for uh, those utility inspectors, the tree overhang. We are giving uh, in leaf on conditions the amount of square footage the tree is overhanging the roof. This is also used to assess fire risk. The building characteristics as well. So we're giving you a little bit of that normalized DSM by giving you the building ground to peak height, to telling you how tall that structure is. We use our oblique camera uh, in conjunction with our machine learning algorithms to count the number of windows and give you an estimated story count of that house as well. Very useful uh, for dispatch and letting uh, first responders know what story that cell signal would be coming from. Um, again, surfaces as well as lawn grasses, asphalt, concrete slabs, um, and vegetation. So medium and high vegetation, trees over six feet, low and very low vegetation as well. So scrubs, um, shrubs, excuse me, and small bushes. All right, we also have just launched as a few weeks ago, uh, as a official near map product, our impact response for post-catastrophe. Um, so we have a very quick turnaround time um, on this program. Uh, a really good example I'll talk about uh, in a little bit, but before that, I know the, uh, the hurricanes, or the, excuse me, the tornadoes that devastated Kentucky and the surrounding six states. Uh, we worked with the city manager of Frankfort, Kentucky there, and were able to provide him uh, with WMS links of all of that imagery that happened, or all of that uh, catastrophe imagery. Uh, that took place over the weekend for um, uh, for that area. So um, I believe the the tornadoes happened just 24 hours before we were able to get up into the to the air and get that imagery in the hands of those first responders so that they can uh, allocate their resources and plan for resilience uh, in the future. So what are some face challenges? Um, for first responders, emergency response, um, they really have to plan and prepare with confidence. Um, and one way to do that is use virtual site inspections to assess risk. What you can do here um, is really conveniently analyze the current landscape to make better informed safety decisions. So in this image, you can uh, understand the existing landscape and structures You'll be able to place staff accordingly and gain insight before an emergency occurs. You can mark up these items on contextual imagery like the building heights and annotations that I've done here, the different measuring tools and the capability to switch between different view angles of the camera, as well as different cardinal directions is going to give you um, a large view of your operating picture and allow you to plan with confidence so that you know the truth on the ground and can be prepared if emergency strikes. Now, let's take another look at uh, this Pompano Beach scene. Another challenge that first responders and emergency personnel have to do is respond promptly and effectively. And they need that by having location intelligence about an area. So um, once again, as we know, you know, these coastal regions are prone to uh, storm surges, flooding, hazard analysis. And, and what we've done here is just categorized a FEMA flood hazard layer on top of this 3D textured mesh to visually tell the story of where are my high risk locations and where are my non high risk or zero risk locations. Those zero risk locations are gonna be shown in that yellow color. Really, you can imagine right in the middle of that sandbar, um, but everything outside in that light purple or dark purple color is going to be um, at risk and hazardous for a one to 2% annual flood risk rise. So combining those data sets is going to allow us to give a little bit more insight and contextual intelligence for that area. Let's take a look at another uh, example here in Boston, Massachusetts. Now, 
Here is my building uh, an area of interest. This is a 3D textured mesh inside of an ArcGIS web scene. And I have a lot of layers loaded up here in addition to my scene layer package. And what I'm gonna do is actually turn on our AI layers. So what I've done is draped our building characteristics and all of our AI layers over top of our 3D textured mesh to give us that added attributes attached to the structure so that I can see the area square footage of the building when it was uh, taken, you know, the status and everything. And you can add even more attributes by putting in your own soft or what I like to call known attributes about that building. You know, it's got four exits on this side of the, on the east side of the building. Um, and now let's visualize a flood scenario. So this is just a layer that you can grab from FEMA. Um, I've brought it into our web scene here and actually categorized the exposed buildings, the ones that would be affected by this sea level rise or storm surge. Uh, we know that this is accurate because I'm actually using the digital elevation model for Boston. So I know the ground elevation uh, when that, when that uh, storm surge or flood comes through. And what we can do is run some Esri geoprocessing tools like this uh, elevation profile right now that I'm running on this structure to see the elevation change from the bare earth and the vertical datum of our 3D content. So as I move across this building, I notice that dip in elevation right in the center. That's where a loading dock is, so that we know that that is gonna be completely flooded, as well as the next two floors up, um, if an emergency like this were, were to occur. So now we can plan and allocate resources better in the future and become stronger and resilient and know our common operating picture. Also having location intelligence about an area is uh, very key to understanding these disasters. And what we've done here is actually taken our near map content a step further and combined various data sets. This one being our uh, LOD2 or level of detail two buildings uh, used by our existing 3D content, as well as our AI building characteristics to create these vectorized containers. What these are going to do is uh, show the ground peak building height and all of the attributes and characteristics of the vectorized buildings uh, just in a 3D capacity so that every analysis that you run, it's going to account for that elevation as well. Uh, the trees are actually done by our point cloud and we've done a thematic uh, analysis of the tree height so we're gathering the average tree height around these buildings and creating a buffer around it. So if these trees were to burn and cause a fire and fall down, these are the areas uh, in red that the buildings would actually be affected. So this is where we need to allocate our resources effectively and plan our, uh, you know, swiftly uh, plan our ingress and egress or entry and exit exit points um, so you can gain a heightened awareness of all of those access points, the vantage points, any obstructions and landmarks to swiftly route law enforcement, fire, or even medical personnel. You have also have to safely manage special events by understanding your common operating picture. Um, events are a, a very large um, piece of emergency response. Uh, I know that um, the Chicago Marathon, which experiences over 1 million visitors every single year, their emergency response unit uses our 3D to plan effectively uh, to have their resources, their staging area, their command center, and all of their officers and personnel near the existing exit, exit points. So what you'll be able to do is ensure that public events are properly planned and executed. You'll fully understand your common operating picture by properly routing traffic in and out and assigning patrol units to prepare for potential emergencies. You can plan and set up entry and exit points, security perimeters, barricades, pedestrian walkways, security checkpoints, and even use a little bit of viewshed analysis from security cameras. 
you will be able to plan and rehearse scenarios to be ready for the unseen. You will be able to recognize high risk environments and accurately put to together plans for hazards and threats that can't be prevented. So here in this situation, I have two security cameras. Uh, they could be anything from security cameras to counter snipers to emergency lookout personnel. But what I'm doing is running a view shed analysis on the top of these two buildings on the parking lot below. Now, uh, the areas in green on the view shed are visible uh, to the camera or the human eye. The areas in pink or that purple color is actually a blonde spot and needs to be addressed. Those are addressed by these areas shown in yellow where it's covered by two or more view sheds. You could do this with security cameras or even officers and personnel to make sure that no officer is outside of the view shed of another officer when setting up a perimeter. You'll be able to gain situational awareness by analyzing the landscape and making better informed decisions. So when talking about post-catastrophe, this is a great example that I like to use often. This is Hurricane Michael when it hit Mexico City Beach in Florida on October 10th. NIRMAF was able to fly this area on October 11th and host this imagery on October 12th. So we have a very, very quick turnaround. And we're here to keep your community resilient in the wake of disaster. Um, in addition to our post-catastrophe impact response program, you can use current near map uh, content to accelerate your recovery efforts. You'll be able to assess damage and identify priority items. You can allocate resources and plan rebuilding activities to restore your infrastructure to its previous state. So what I've done here is taken this 3D image uh, from Mexico City Beach, and then I've categorized the damaged and destroyed structures to streamline um, the city's recovery efforts and resource allocation so that they, become, they can become resilient uh, for the next disaster. A direct example of this is our impact response for the city of Talent, Oregon, okay? The entire city just evacuated for the fire and 2,000 people were left homeless. <clears throat> Currently, 400 residents are still living in hotel accommodations and waiting for FEMA trailers to arrive. Talent and the surrounding area is still recovery and have been using these ArcGIS applications with uh, near map content for pre and post fire aerial imagery for recovery efforts. And I'd actually be glad to share this story map with all of you after this call. I think it's a really good read, <clears throat> and um, it really documents some of those efforts and use cases in the wake of disaster. So uh, that is all that I have for you today. Well, thanks so much. We appreciate you being here, Charles, and uh, thank you to everyone for coming today. We hope to see you again at another Near Map and Directions Mag webinar. Um, we have more of those happening later in the year. So do stop by again and uh, be sure to tell a friend about directions and near map.